common apologist argument for God is that the universe had a first cause, and that first cause had to be a conscious mind because only conscious minds, because they supposedly have free will, can carry out actions that don't have prior causes. A first cause, that is, a cause that was not itself caused by any prior occurrence, therefore had to be a decision made by a mind. A common rebuttal to this is that subatomic particles in the quantum vacuum often pop into existence without any cause. So it clearly isn't the case that only minds can do uncaused things. Sometimes physical entities can do spontaneous things as well. Here's Frank Turek to try to explain this away. Uh, hang on, John. That's a good question. The quantum vacuum question. And as you know, Dr. Craig uh, deals with that question quite a bit uh, on the quantum vacuum. Well, my, my, I'm going to relent the point that that could be true, that if that it, if something is sufficient for something to uh, happen, it can happen. Okay, the, the problem is, let me, let me just deal with the quantum issue, because it's a, good, it's a good objection to bring up, because many atheists, of course, bring it up, that there's a quantum vacuum out there. But first of all, at the quantum level, subatomic particles do not come into being out of nothing, non-being. The subatomic vacuum is comprised of fluctuating energy. So it's not nothing, it still is something. The question is, what created the quantum vacuum? Well, when a mind makes a decision, it doesn't do so out of nothing either. Minds exist in a universe. Even if it were the case that they are capable of spontaneous, causeless action, which I'm not convinced is true, the fact remains that every mind with which we have direct contact exists within a universe. And thus, we have no reason to infer that minds, per se, are any more capable than anything else of existing without space-time in which to exist. The argument that the cause of the universe must be a mind is that only a mind can exist in the absence of any universe, and only a mind can carry out spontaneous, causeless actions, both of which are necessary to be a cause of all physical reality. This isn't very convincing because we have no reason to believe that a mind can exist without a universe. We have no reason to believe that what the mind does is spontaneous rather than caused. And even if it is, we have good reason to believe that a mind is not the only kind of thing that can carry out spontaneous actions. And Lawrence Krauss's book, which talks about a universe from nothing, he equivocates on what the word nothing means. In fact, even an atheist from Columbia University pointed that out to him in the New York Times, which really frosted Dr. Krauss. But the he was pointing out that the subatomic realm is not nothing. It still needs to be created. This sounds like Frank believes that anything which is not nothing needs to be created. If he believes this, he would certainly make a special plea that such a principle doesn't apply to God. So even if there is a subatomic realm and there are these apparent uncaused uh, uh, causes or, or uncaused effects coming out of it, does not mean that the universe could be one of those causes because it still would require the cause of the subatomic realm. This seems like moving the goalpost to me. The initial argument was that only minds can carry out uncaused events, but the fact that particles can pop into the subatomic realm without a cause shows that not to be true. Turek's rebuttal to this seems to be a different subject, that the subatomic realm itself still needs a cause, and presumably he believes that only a mind can be the cause of such a thing. But why? If particles can pop into existence without a mind being the cause, why is it still the case that the universe as a whole still needs a mind to be its cause? How do you rule out the possibility that the subatomic realm itself popped into existence spontaneously? Also, it's highly speculative. There are at least 10 different interpretations of quantum mechanics. Some are deterministic, some are not. And according to Victor Stenger, there's no consensus as to what the right one is. Well, that leaves open the possibility that the non-deterministic ones are correct, then, doesn't it? If there's no consensus, then the non-deterministic interpretations haven't been ruled out. If it's possible for physical things to carry out non-deterministic events, then you can't rule out the possibility that the beginning of the universe was itself a physical non-deterministic event. This also may be an issue of unpredictability rather than uncausality. Or it may be an issue of uncausality rather than unpredictability. If we can't be sure either way, then we can't rule out the possibility that physical events can be uncaused. If you can't rule out uncausality, then you can't say that minds are the only things that can carry out uncaused events. Well, I'm, I'm willing to grant all those points okay. for this. What's that? I'm going to make this quick as possible, but okay. here, here are my premises that I believe uh, show that, that you haven't proved that there's a personal God. It's uh, The universe has a beginning. I'm willing to grant that. Uh, God's willingness to create the universe is eternal. I'm willing to grant that point. Uh, God's willingness to create the universe is causally sufficient for the, the existence of the universe. I'm willing to grant that point. Uh, if the cause is eternal and sufficient for the existence of, the, uh, of something, uh, then the thing is also eternal. 
Um, if the thing is eternal, that does, uh, that means it doesn't have a beginning. Therefore, the universe does not have a begin does and does not have a beginning, thus breaking the law of non-contradiction. That's an interesting point. If God is eternal and he doesn't ever change his mind, then his will to create the universe is also eternal. If his will to create the universe is eternal, why isn't the universe itself eternal? If God doesn't change, then what does it mean to say that he used his free will to decide to create the universe? The very idea of a decision implies a change. If God doesn't change, then how can he make decisions? Uh, the idea is that without time, you can't say that God, you know, is like Aristotle. At one point he's sitting down and he plans to stand up and he stands up. That without time you can't demarcate change. So that well, God doesn't there, change, so there why? No, well, there's no point where the God, God is creating, there, or there's a point where God is both not creating and creating the universe. According no, to the, the point at which he creates the universe is simultaneous with the creation of the universe. So time is created at the beginning. That's the problem, though. The beginning is a point in time. Time can't be created at the beginning because the beginning is the earliest moment in time. And you can't create something at a time when it already exists. By then it's too late. The beginning is the earliest moment at which time exists. And you can't create time at the earliest moment at which it exists because it already exists at the earliest moment at which it exists. Causes must always temporally precede their effects. Since nothing can temporally precede time itself, time cannot have a cause. Just as the argument that I put up there earlier was, just as the Bible talks about. And so God, when he creates, and we're using temporal language because we're in time, when I say when he creates, that's when the space-time continuum is created. Frank's not articulating this very well. Saying that when God creates the space-time continuum is when the space-time continuum is created is meaningless. He seems to mean that the universe comes into existence at the moment that God causes it. This, as I explained, doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense to create something at a time when it already exists. And it wouldn't make sense to create time before time exists, because there's no such thing as before time itself. So it's simultaneous with his creation event is when time begins. Which is a contradiction. You can't create something at the same time that it already exists. Yeah, but that, that's a nonsensical argument. You Why is it nonsensical? Because the cause can't be simultaneous to its effect. Give me an example within... within oh, sure. You see that projector right there? Yep. That, that projector is being simultaneously uh, held by the bolts and that rod to the ceiling. Okay. The, the cause is simultaneous to that projector being held in, the, in the air. In fact, it's not. The force that keeps the atoms of the chassis holding the projector from just falling through the atoms of the bolts instead of being held in place by them is the electromagnetic force, which does not propagate instantaneously. The fact that this interaction is continuous for as long as the projector is in place just gives the illusion that the interaction is simultaneous. There is not a complete overlap between the cause and the effect. The cause very slightly precedes the effect. Okay, but the cause is simultaneous to that projector being held in, but the, it in wasn't, the air. it wasn't being held before it was bolted on. Exactly, and there actually was a small increment of time between when the bolts made contact and the chassis stopped moving. Well, there was a point when it began, that's true, but right now that cause is simultaneous. No, it's co-continuous. That's not the same thing as simultaneous. There are two actions running in parallel, but they're not simultaneous because they didn't begin at the same time. With its effect. Yeah, but you're saying that this cause has no... Uh, and it has nothing before it. So you, God has nothing before it because God's outside of time. Then God doesn't exist because to say that something exists outside of time is to say that it never exists. In fact, this is, this is even known through general relativity. In fact, this is from the... Uh, hold on, let me see if I can find it here. This is from the Stanford Encyclopedia of... Philosophy, which your own esteemed Dr. Tim McGrew has, who's sitting in the back here, has actually contributed to, particularly on the subject of miracles. This is not his article, but this is what uh, the article says. The theory of relativity is generally taken to support the idea that the universe is a four-dimensional space-time block, that time is a matter of perspective, and that an ideal knower outside the universe would observe it all at once. The only way you could be outside the universe is if you were in some other universe, some other space-time continuum. You still can't be outside of time per se. And the idea that all points in time are equally real actually contradicts the idea that anything really comes into existence. 
According to relativity, everything that will ever exist in the future, in a sense, already exists in the future, and therefore its participation with reality is not contingent. This is why William Lane Craig tied himself into knots trying to come up with an interpretation of relativity that preserved contingency. I'll put a link in the description to a video I did explaining why his interpretation of relativity is nonsensical. So this is not illogical to believe this. But John, we can talk more after if you want. That's fine. It is actually illogical to believe that something can exist independent of any and all space-time. The fact that the Stanford Encyclopedia speculated as to how something hypothetically would look from outside the universe does not mean that it takes seriously the idea that something can exist without existing in any place or at any time. To everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.